community. My name is Katie Jacob Stanton. I'm the Vice President of International Market Development at Twitter. I'm super excited to be here at Republica today. It's the first time that Twitter has been here. And the main reason why we wanted to come to Republica and come to Berlin is to really thank you. Most of you in this audience have been early adopters of Twitter. You've been with us since the beginning. You've laid the foundation for Twitter in Germany and Twitter in Europe. And we really appreciate your feedback and your honesty. In fact, we know that Sasha Lobo was here earlier this week, and, um, and he's been a great advocate for us and given us a lot of good, honest feedback. And it's that honest feedback that makes us better. And so we encourage you to use the hashtag RP12 and then do a CC to our Twitter account, at Twitter underscore DE, and our team is listening. We're listening in English and in German and probably in whatever language you're, you're tweeting in. And, um, and we really want to hear from you and to continue to have this conversation. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Twitter, our vision as a company and as a product. Twitter brings you closer. What does that mean? Over the past couple of years, we've heard stories from our users around the world and stories about news breaking, about revolutions, about joys and, and tears when their favorite team wins or loses a particular game. We've heard stories about people after a disaster, people who are meeting their friends and family, people who are connecting. And what that has taught us is that Twitter brings you closer to what you most care about in real time. And before I share some of the stories that we're seeing, I want to share some of the high-level uh, pieces of information about Twitter. We're growing, we're global, and we're mobile. So first, growth. We're growing fast. We have over 400 million unique visits to Twitter every month. We have over, four, or, sorry, we have over uh, 140 million active users. And we're also up to about 340 million tweets a day. That's a lot of content. The conversations are growing. So just to give you some you know, perspective of scale, so every three days or so, we're seeing about one billion tweets. We're processing almost one billion tweets. And so it took us originally three years, two months, and a day for us to reach that first billion tweet. So, uh, so that's a, a, a lot of conversations going on around the world. Around the world, we're global. So over 70% of all of our accounts are outside of the United States. From the beginning, Twitter knew that we were a global company and that we needed to do a good job to help scale our business and our product um, to, to fit the international market. We're now available in 28 languages. Um, we use the, a, a crowdsource model where we ask the community and volunteers from around the world in multiple languages. We have over 600,000 translators today who volunteer to make Twitter available in their languages. Um, some fun facts. We have one out of six accounts that are set to Spanish. It's one of our most active accounts after English. And what's really exciting for us is that we've seen Arabic grow as the fastest language ever on Twitter. We recently launched Twitter in four of the right to left uh, languages, and Arabic, and Hebrew, and Farsi, and Urdu. And so it's very exciting to make sure that you know, we reach every person on the planet and make Twitter as accessible and useful to them wherever they are. Japan was one of the first markets to adopt Twitter. Um, they, they adopted Twitter early, um, mostly because everyone was on a mobile device. And they've become some of our most prolific tweeters. In fact, one of our jokes is that you know, in, in Japanese and Chinese and Korean, all the double byte languages, you can practically write a novel in 140 characters. We have three offices outside the US. We're a six-year-old company. We're in London and, and Dublin and Tokyo. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, more information later. Third, we're powered by mobile. Twitter was born on a mobile device. That's why we're at 140 characters. So we know how important mobile uh, usage is around the world and how important it is to make sure that Twitter is accessible no matter what device you're using. If you're here in Berlin on your iPad with a Wi-Fi connection, or if you're in sub-Saharan Africa on a rudimentary Nokia phone, it's important that we're able to make sure that you can access and use and discover the value of Twitter. In fact, one out of six of our users actually sign up on a mobile device. There are millions of ways to use Twitter. 
out of those 140 million active users, 60% of our users actually produce tweets and listen, whereas 40% are just listening. And what that has taught us is that you don't need to tweet, you don't need to tweet to get value out of Twitter. Um, just by comparison, YouTube, only 1% of YouTube users will actually produce the content. Um, the rest are, are listening and watching. So content, there's a lot of content on, on Twitter. And we wanted to share a little bit about who are the top content producers on Twitter. Politicians, no surprise. They want to connect with their, their electorate. They want to connect with their audiences. We've seen political leaders around the world join Twitter. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We've certainly see this, seen this in the United States. We're seeing this in other markets. 2012 is a very important year globally for a lot of presidential elections. We've seen a lot of great um, activity happening in Mexico and France um, in particular. Oops. Athletes. We've seen athletes from around the world, um, especially the, the basketball players, the soccer players, handball players, tennis players. Um, there's a lot of content from a lot of the athletes on Twitter. Humanitarians. We're seeing humanitarians and their agencies and organizations around the world using Twitter to help extend their brand, to help engage with audiences, to share their causes, and to raise money. Entertainers. From Justin Bieber to Matthias Schweighofer, we're seeing a lot of entertainers, movie stars, and musicians around the world join. And then TV shows. Um, in the US, at least, 100% of the most popular TV shows are actually on Twitter. And they're doing a really good job about integrating and, and engaging the audience to um, participate in the shows. Today, we have roughly 38 heads of state or their government representatives on Twitter, from the White House to number 10, to Paul Kagame in Rwanda, to, um, uh, the, uh, to uh, the Blue House in Korea. And, um, and, and we've seen a lot of this, uh, this grow around the world. And people tweet in different ways. Some are very formal. Um, the White House is pretty formal, pretty engaging. Paul Kagame, if you tweet to him today, he'll probably tweet to you right back. Um, another data point for you. Roughly 80% of the G20 are on Twitter. The only five that are missing are Indonesia, Italy, Saudi Arabia, China, which government blocks us and doesn't allow us to uh, participate, and Germany. And, uh, and so one of the things that um, we're hopeful about Germany is maybe you guys can get Merkel on Twitter to trend using the hashtag Merkel on, on Twitter. You, maybe. I know our friend uh, Stefan Zybert is up next, so maybe that was kind of unfair. But, um, but he's been doing a great job. And, um, and he's been you know, one of the earliest adopters in terms of a lot of politicians on Twitter. And he's conducted two Twitter interviews. Um, the second was just yesterday. So he's really doing a good job. But any extra help you can give us, that would be great. So while there's a lot of content coming from a lot of sources, Twitter is event driven, and we've seen huge spikes in conversations around um, sporting events. So what this chart shows is about uh, six out of the, uh, the 10 uh, most active events discussed on Twitter are around a sporting event. The World Cup, the Copa, um, it could be uh, the Super Bowl, and, uh, and we've seen a lot of soccer games enjoy a lot of content and participation. Um, several of our other major events happen around TV shows. The BET Awards, when Beyonce was on MTV Awards and she rubbed her belly indicating that she was pregnant, everyone rejoiced and, uh, and had a conversation about it. And then, um, and the last one in, happened in Japan during New Year's Eve. And it's Japanese tradition and custom on New Year's Eve where people will call their friends and family and wish them a happy new year. And now they're starting to tweet that. And just to give you a little bit of perspective and context, that Twitter has become this second screen for these events and how it's evolved. So just a few years ago for the Super Bowl, which is the big national um, football game um, in the United States where everyone tunes in in the US, um, we had about 27 tweets per second in 2008. That increased to over 4,000 just last year. And this year, we were over 12,000 tweets per second. So it's growing. 
So many of you, especially bloggers and newsmakers, you fully well understand the power of Twitter as, as, as Twitter bringing you closer to the news. You're finding out more and more in real time what's happening in the world. You can tune in at any time and see what journalists are saying, the professional journalists, the professional institutions um, as they break news. But what's also different is that you see more and more citizen journalists. Twitter has become this open source newsroom where people are able to find out what's going on in the world from the people who are right there. Um, this has happened all over the world. You know, probably one of the most famous tweets happened with Wael Gonim in Egypt when he said, welcome back, um, uh, uh, hashtag Jan25. Sports. Sports has been huge on Twitter, games. Twitter brings you closer to the arena, to the stadium, to the locker room, wherever you may be. And I wanted to share one example that happened just a couple months ago that wasn't necessarily about the game, but was at one of the, um, the halftime events called uh, the Sprite Slam. So the NBA had a slam dunking contest, you know, when you kind of dribble your ball and you go up and you slam the, the basketball down the hoop. And they did this great contest. And they asked the audience not just, you know, to, to tweet about it, but to actually influence the outcome of the contest. So they asked the audience to use hashtag Sprite Slam with the name of their favorite player. And what happened is that we saw something like 370,000 tweets in a matter of about uh, 20 seconds or 20 minutes um, during the course of this event. And at its very peak, it accounted for 15% of all worldwide tweets. So it was a pretty fun way for the NBA and for basketball fans to be able to, again, just not just participate, but to influence the outcome. The other thing that they did, which was really creative, is that they had this auto-tweet capability. So it was a, a, the NBA backboard cam, which literally gave you this 360 perspective of, of what it looked like for the, the athlete and the basketball player to slam, uh, to, to, to dunk the ball. This chart reflects the difference in the number and the volume of hashtags when the, the organizers gave a very specific call to action. Um, they said, you know, use Sprite Slam, you will influence the outcome of the, uh, this, uh, this game. And, uh, and you can see how much it outperformed some of our other major hashtag events, including a freak earthquake on the east coast of the United States, as well as this, call to, or this, uh, this Mad Lib type of hashtag, um, what will Gaga wear during the MTV Awards? Television. So Twitter brings you closer to TV in the sense that television has always been social. Since its very inception, people were gathered around the living room with their friends, with their family, and watching their favorite show. And Twitter brings you closer because you get to participate in that conversation around your program. Um, and I'll share some examples. The first example is about politics. So in the US, as many of you know, we're about to engage in a, in a very heated uh, election between uh, Mitt Romney and President Obama. And during the primary campaigns, Fox News worked with us to help engage the audience. And so they had, I'm gonna show you a clip, and what they did is that they had all the candidates up there. They asked the audience, is this candidate answering the question? And if they're answering the question, use hashtag answer. If they're dodging the question, use hashtag dodge. And in real time, you could feel the pulse of what people were thinking. Uh-oh, no sound. Tell the candidates are answering the questions. Tweet the candidate's last name and hashtag answer if you think he's tackling the question, or hashtag dodge if you think he's avoiding the question. But we're going to take a break right here. Remember to send your thoughts on how the candidates are answering the questions via Twitter. Uh, tweet the candidate's last name and hashtag answer or hashtag dodge. Send me questions at, at Brett Bear. Include that hashtag SC debate. I don't know if your Twitter page is like mine. Mine is on fire. What have they, what's kind of been the consensus for the first hour of the debate? Let's take a look at this because this is very interesting. We've got the green line here for Newt Gingrich, a white line for Rick Santorum, and an orange line for Mitt Romney. Let's drill down on this and take a look at Mitt Romney, where the biggest dodges were perceived to be. First of all, his uh, answer and his back and forth with Rick Santorum on this issue of felons and whether or not they should be allowed to vote. People thought that he was dodging that, and look at the numbers here. And then on his tax records, he was seen as dodging that question so much that we couldn't actually record the number of 
were people who were saying that he was dodging. The foreign policy, tweet me your questions. At Brett Baer, include hashtag SC debate. After this break, at Mr. Whiteman, has no child left behind been a success or a failure? If latter, what needs to be done to change it? Let's go to John Roberts with an update on how the Twitter audience thought the candidates fared tonight. Hi, John. Hey, Newt Gingrich did very well on foreign policy. Mitt Romney, as you can see, below the line. I've got to tell you, he spent most of the night below the line. Rick Santorum, seen as giving good answers, as well as uh, Rick Perry. And Ron Paul, we've got to tell you, Ron Paul spent the entire night in the good answer uh, section. And looking here at Newt Gingrich, Romney's record, he was a little more of a dodge than he was a good answer. The economy getting good points, race getting very good Good points. Foreign policy, pretty much the same thing. That's the way it came out tonight. It's actually quite funny to re-look at this now that we know who the candidate is going to be and how, <laughs> how poorly he did. <laughs> And here's a chart that you saw during this clip, and it shows the, 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 the dodge versus the answer. And this is a really important chart. And what it taught all of us is that, you know, for newsmakers, that we knew what would be on the front page of all the U.S. newspapers the next day. It would be all about the tax records. People had a very visceral reaction to that. Like, why isn't he releasing his tax records? And, um, and so that was one thing. The second thing is that Mitt Romney's team, they were very, very smart about it. They realized, okay, obviously, like, we, we need to listen, and we need to get out these tax uh, records as soon as possible. And so they have become actually one of the strongest users of Twitter and Twitter analytics to be able to really get the most out of Twitter, to be able to amplify some of the positive news and, and try to squash some of the negative news using Twitter and just being a lot more proactive um, about uh, how they communicate on uh, our network. I'm going to show you another one very small clip, too, that talks about how Twitter brings you closer with reality TV. And reality TV, for better or for worse, has become very popular, of course, in Germany, in the UK, and in the US. And this is how um, uh, uh, these guys used it in order to get, the U uh, sorry, to get the population to participate in the show. Let's check in with our Twitter wall, shall we? <laughs> you guys have been incredibly busy. Tell us, which judge do you agree with the most or least? Use the hashtags on the screen right now to get on Twitter and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Now, here's the last performance. It's the final singer of the over 30s. So the X Factor has used this both to sort of tell us how are we doing, how are the judges doing, um, and they've also used this to help, again, influence the outcome. Who would you like to win? You know, tweet your vote um, for any of these uh, uh, different participants. If something is happening on television, it's already happening on, on Twitter. And what this chart reflects is sort of the conversations, the tweets that are happening related to some of these US popular shows. And even if we stripped out the names, Glee, American Idol, and so forth, um, this would still work for Tatort. This would still work and be the case for DSDS and for Germany's Next Top Model. You see spikes about these television shows you know, as they happen. And then if you even dive in more closely, you'll see spikes when you know, the criminal is revealed or sort of um, you know, when the contestant has been uh, uh, nominated or elected or wins uh, a certain prize. And so um, the conversations are on high speed at, during the episode. And then they taper off, of course, but they still happen midway. So that's all great, blah, blah, blah. That's all Twitter in the US. What about Twitter in Germany? What are you guys doing? So again, many of you have been with us for a long time, but I want to share something that you might know about Twitter in Germany. So this is a sketch that Jack Dorsey, our inventor, um, had of Twitter in the very early days. And he was challenged by trying to um, get a prototype of Twitter up in two weeks. And so he leaned on our first engineer and asked him to help prototype it. And that engineer, Florian Weber, was in Hamburg, Germany. And so he actually developed um, you know, the very first prototype of, of Germany, working with several of our other colleagues. And so Twitter has these engineering roots here in Germany. 
And over the years, we've had challenges. Um, we've had challenges of discovery. How do we help you as a user discover the most, the most relevant and interesting real-time content for you? With a billion tweets every couple of days, that's a lot of content. The second challenge we've had is scale. Again, a lot of content. How do we help scale this so everybody can get the information they're looking for quickly? We've also had the challenge of, of content. Um, there's a lot of content on there, a lot of English content on there. How do we make sure in Germany we're able to surface for you better German content? So we have a small team here in Germany, and they've been working really hard over the past couple of months, working with a number of the different TV stations, for example, to share a lot of the best practices that we've seen in other markets, and also to try to find and define the best types of, of, of integrations that might be most relevant in Germany and can even start here. So we work with ZDF and ARD and ProSieben. Um, we've also done some, uh, several uh, sports integrations with Sports Show and, uh, and with Sky. And they've been really good about trying to you know, get hashtags on air and to involve the audience in a lot of these conversations. One thing that we started in uh, Germany that we don't have in any other markets, actually, something we call the Sports One Box. And we were very lucky because we have this very passionate um, German engineer at Twitter in San Francisco who's a Dortmund fan. Any Dortmund fans? Yeah. <laughs> that was really easy. That's pandering. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and, and what we realized is that Germans love soccer. You talk to any German, they all have their favorite soccer club, their favorite soccer player, and everyone's got an opinion. And, um, and how do we make sure that we um, bring better soccer content onto our platform? So we launched this so you can get these real-time sports uh, scores for the Bundesliga one. And um, we've seen great upticks so far. So not only do you see the scores, scores are great, but you see the conversations. You see when people are screaming to one another, goal, and you see when people rejoice when there's a score and, um, and when they're really mad about whatever. And, um, and so one of the things we want to do is help scale this. And so again, this is something that we started here in Germany. Uh, we want to expand this to other sports and we also want to help expand this to other markets. Here are some of the tweets that we've seen along the way. So a lot of good tweets from fans, from broadcasters, and then some uh, uh, behind the scenes types of tweets and pictures. And then politics. I've uh, mentioned Stefan Seibert before, but we're seeing a lot of politicians actually take the lead on Twitter. As I mentioned earlier, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when these politicians are going to join. We were super excited today to see um, Chairman Gabriel join Twitter from the SPD. We know the Pirates and the Greens and all the political parties here in Germany have been active on Twitter. So, um, so again, we're really excited. Is Merkel on Twitter trending yet in Germany? Anyone know? Not yet, okay, you guys still have work to do. I'm gonna keep talking until it's trending. <laughs> and then there's one more thing. Um, so there's been a lot of speculation. <laughs> There's been a lot of speculation about Twitter, and Jack Dorsey announced at ZLD in January that we're building uh, a team here in Germany. And we're really excited to confirm that we will have our office here in Berlin. So um, it's very exciting for us. And uh, we're really looking forward um, uh, to growing our team here. We have two employees who are here in the front row, Rowan Barnett, who's our market director, who just literally joined uh, last week, um, and this is his first week on the ground in, in Germany working for Twitter, and Isa Zonfeld, who's our partnerships manager, working with, again, the TV stations and, and the sports teams and, and, and the artists to help get them on Twitter. So we want to hear from you. I hope you've been tweeting some good ideas for us and some honest feedback, and, um, and we look forward to really building a business in a way that makes us proud here in Germany. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. Uh, are there any questions right now? Okay. I think we need, yeah, we need a few microphones right now. Okay, here first. Uh. Yeah. Me first? Yeah. Okay, here, Katie, over here, right side. Um, as far I'm as a, <laughs> I'm working as an IT recruitment specialist, I would like to know how many people do you need in Berlin? <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> well played. <laughs> Um, it's a small team. Um, you know, we're, we're you know, starting with a small team first, um, no specific numbers. Um, but if you have great candidates, feel free to send them my way um, at KDS at Twitter. Okay, the next one. Ah, da wird das Mikrofon noch gesucht. Ah, es ist gefunden worden. Yeah. Can we go boy, girl, boy, girl? Over okay. there. Here I am. Oh. Right back here. Do you see me? Katie, no. no. Here I am. Waving doesn't help. All right, anyway, still waving. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. man. Okay. All right. First of all, I'm a professional journalist, and I want to say thank you to Twitter. Uh, I'm covering defense affairs, and when looking at the Afghan war, Twitter is one of the fastest venues of information. I had sometimes information about uh, suicide attacks and things like that before even the German command in Germany had this information. So that was pretty impressive. My question, however, is when there will be a verified account for all of us? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, we have a small team that works with verification, and what we've tried to do is put together a very clear process, verifying um, you know, uh, uh, political leaders and brands and, um, and making sure we have um, and, and athletes and journalists and people that often have a lot of influence. And it's one of our challenges this year is because we take it so seriously, we, don't, we can't possibly verify everybody with the small team that we have. We have um, a little over 800 employees, uh, most of whom are based in San Francisco. So, um, um, it's something that we are working on. Um, we've, we have a, a newsroom team that also works with journalists to help verify journalists. Um, so there too, you know, for the journalists in the room and, and others, if, you know, again, just email me and, um, and our team and we're happy to send you to our verification team for, for follow-up. Yeah. I know the next question is over here. Oh. I come to you. Uh, yeah. Um, excuse me, I'm just wondering uh, how many Twitter accounts are there in Germany? We don't break out our numbers um, in Germany or in any specific markets, but there are third parties that do report on some of our numbers, and it's pretty easy to find that data. <laughs> Can we go to, uh, great. Thanks. Okay, um, I work for the foreign ministry, and we're still pretty new with social media. So um, what would you suggest if we thought about uh, using Twitter? Like, what, what would you suggest to a ministry? Yeah. You should join. <laughs> and yeah. do what? Yeah, so um, we've seen some great examples with foreign ministries in Sweden, Carl Bildt, in the UK, William Hague, and in the US with Secretary Clinton and the State Department. And the ways that they've been using it has been a variety of different ways. You have to do what's comfortable for you. But first, to be able to represent foreign policy. You know, here's what the foreign minister thinks about the situation in Afghanistan, um, you know, whatever the issue might be. So the official statement. It's also engaging with citizens. It's engaging with their counterparts in other places. Um, embassies and consulates around the world have been really active on Twitter. Um, there was an issue last November when an Egyptian-American woman, uh, 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 Mona, was in Tahrir Square and she was beaten. And, um, and she was able to borrow a friend's phone and she tweeted about it. And within 20 minutes, Andy Carvin of NPR, Nick Kristoff of, of New York Times, they both had tweeted with the hashtag Free Mona. And within a few hours or so, the US Embassy in Egypt responded and said, we're aware of the situation, um, we're, we're working behind the scenes, it's important for us to make sure that she gets freed. And it was a great way for an embassy to work proactively about a very serious situation on the ground. So, um, so that's just another way that, that you can use it. And I would say the last way is um, just general Q&As. William Hague in the UK does this, where every once in a while, <laughs> UK in the house, and um, uh, every once in a while he will do this Q&A and have people say, you know, ask me anything, any question, and as a foreign minister, you can kind of pick which questions and what sort of themes you want to answer, and it, it's just a very great way to be open and transparent and participatory. Um, hello, my name is Martin, and I um, once was a very happy posters user, and now I'm not very happy. So what's going on with posters? You know, I don't have a good answer for you because I'm a little bit farther moved from posters, but I'd be happy to take your feedback 
back to Sachin and the team. Um, they, we, they just joined us a couple weeks ago, so I think it might take some time to help with the integration and, and, and still support it. But if you can send some specific feedback, that'd be great. Oh. It might be. But we'll get your contact information and follow up with the Postgres team. One of the last questions over here. Um, hello, my name is Maren. I'm a very heavy user of Twitter in Germany for three years now. And uh, since I'm on Twitter, I hear speculations about the business model. Mm -hmm. So uh, Facebook bought Instagram recently. Last night I read LinkedIn bought uh, SlideShare. So when is Twitter going to be sold? <laughs> <laughs> No, we're, <laughs> Twitter is in it for the long term. Um, we've worked very hard about building this business in a way that makes us proud. And we launched our advertising platform uh, two years ago. And we've extended it to several international markets. And we're very pleased with its performance to date. What we've done differently is that we haven't really slept, not really, we haven't slapped on ads somewhere on the page that try to get the user's attention. What we've tried to do is make sure that the advertising experience is, is woven into the fabric of the consumer experience in a good, positive, and um, useful way. And what we found as a result that compared to a lot of digital and display um, and text uh, ads, that the performance for, of Twitter ad, of promoted products on Twitter far exceeds that of, of some of the other offerings. So whereas a display ad, you might have 0.01% click through, or our average engagement rates are between three and 5%. And in fact, one of our best performing ads was from a German company from Volkswagen um, that announced a new Beetle. And when they started their campaign, they had a picture, they had a promoted trend, and they had promoted tweets, and they did a really good job. And they had 55% engagement on that effort. More people clicked on that ad than didn't. So we're really pleased with the way that the advertising business is growing for us, and we're going to continue to invest in it and continue to grow our global audience. OK, I Great. think one more question, or oh, there's one question. Or oh, you're just trying to say hello to a friend, okay. <laughs> I don't know. One more question or not? Okay, what? Last one. Hey, just very quickly. Um, I was wondering why you chose Berlin uh, out of all the cities in Germany. What was so special about Berlin that made you base Twitter here? There are a great question. There are a lot of wonderful cities in Germany, you know, Munich and Hamburg and, and Berlin. And, um, and the reason why we chose Berlin was because that there, it's, a, it's a center, it's the capital of Germany, and it's a hub in Europe of developers and, and creative artists. And, um, and there's so much great energy happening here. Um, and much of what Twitter does is break down walls. And we really couldn't have found a better place for us than here in Berlin. I think that's it. Thank you.